Hi, Stuart. Hey, Ryan. How you doing? How are you? Good. How's everything? Not bad. Good? Yeah, definitely. It's nice and warm out in New Jersey. It's getting into the upper 80s. Well, I grew up in Philadelphia, so I kind of know it, even though it's hotter now than when I grew up one time ago with global warming. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you get to the ocean occasionally, will you? Yeah, um, I've gone to the beach a few times in the last month. I went to actually swim there and the ocean is still quite cold. It's yeah. about 50 something degrees. Yeah, I guess it peaks out, what, the high 60s in August or something? Yeah. Well, it's warmer than the Snake River here. So. Oh, that's for sure, yep. Yeah, well, that was quite a movie you, you picked this time. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, I liked it. Yeah, it's interesting because it got kind of panned by the reviews. And I think, you know, it wasn't the same level of story as the first mm -hmm. one and the same characters. Okay. But still, it costs 165 million to make it and it still made 400 million, but they consider that somehow. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, failure because the first one made 900 million or something. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. I wonder where the cost was. I mean, a lot of that I thought was special effects, but obviously they had 165 million of cost. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe just to travel to all those different locations. Perhaps it was filmed in many different places. Uh, I think so. Yeah, so I'm reading filming happened in Nevada, London, um, even in Dubai at the Burj Khalifa, the tallest building in the world. Mm -hmm. And then it said it was largely shot in New Mexico, I guess, just where it's like completely empty. Right. Here's where that uh, final battle yeah. took place in the salt flats. Well, that's what it looks like. Yeah. yeah. Is that where they, well, it's actually the Utah salt flats where they race cars, the Bonneville. Yes, yeah, they have the, they try to set the speed records. Oh, it says it. It says the climactic is filmed in the Bonneville salt flats in Utah. Mm. Yeah. In Utah. Yeah. Oh, Ann, Hi, welcome Ellen. back. Oh, thank you. How are you, Ryan? Doing well. How are you? You know, not bad for an old lady. Excellent. So I don't know what's going on with Deb there. She's on mute and Deb, if you're there, uh, hello. <laughs> Maybe she, well, your judgment, whether you want to wait or start, I'm happy to start. Um, I think she can hear us. Um, she just might have her microphone off. Maybe she's doing something with the dog. Yeah. But um, yeah, we'll present our title slide. I think this came out pretty well, just playing around with the uh, different colors. Mm -hmm. but, um, so yeah, we have this shot of the mother, the mothership. So they're sort of ho hovering over the planet. And this image captured my attention. And I really wondered <laughs> if this could physically happen, if we could have this gigantic structure taking up a good fraction of the Earth's surface. And yeah, they said it was 3,000 miles across. Yeah, and that looks pretty yeah. to scale. 
Yeah. Right. Like the United States is 3,000 miles across. Exactly. And this looks like uh, England, France, and uh, yeah. Spain right. Peninsula. Right. You know, mm -hmm. France, the Iberian Peninsula. And yeah. <clears throat> I think it's pretty uh, impressive that whoever landed this ship was able to get it to touch down on land where all these little feet are stretched out and didn't have to sit in the ocean because that's pretty hard to do it's pretty hard to uh be completely on land if you got a ship like this but what really intrigued me was could you have a structure of this size sit on the planet like that without having the tidal forces disrupting the Earth. structure of that ship and i remember watching a video about how high can we build so like the tallest building in the world is a few thousand feet tall um and then you ask well we could just keep building and building do we have a limit and from this photo it looks as if this ship in terms of height is a few kilometers tall at least. And the earth is rotating. So here's the problem we have from an engineering perspective. The earth is rotating, right? And so that means the top of this ship is flying around at a faster rate than anything on the bottom of the ship. So it's following the earth? Right, yeah. Picture, picture this. Let's say you wanna build a tower and it's nothing um, complex. Let's, say it's, let's just say it's like a, a TV tower, like a steel beam starting from the ground and you build up and you just start building this tremendously tall beam, you know, straight up into the sky, there is a limit to how tall you can build because they'll get to a point where this top of the beam is spinning around so much faster than the bottom. And what happens is due to just um, centripetal centrifugal force is it's gonna get ripped apart from just the earth's rotation. Um, so it's hard for me to believe that such a structure could just sit nicely on the planet without having any um, loss of well, if it was strong integrity. strong enough, you know, much stronger than we can make it now. Would you assume? You know, there's a point where they probably could make it strong enough um, that it wouldn't rip apart. I guess the question then is, would it? What would something that large, if it didn't rip apart, would it put drag on the whole planet somehow? Or yeah, and you know that's another thing: conservation of angular momentum. So you have the Earth is spinning; that has some angular momentum to it, and then this ship landing onto the Earth has to impart some net change in the angular momentum. So it's not like the earth is just gonna keep spinning around the way it does. Right now you're planting a pretty significant extra mass mm -hmm. onto the earth. And so it has Did to happen. Did that thing land on the earth? Hmm? Did that thing land on the earth? Um, or did it just hover? So yeah, I guess from, from this perspective, I guess you can't really tell if this is truly sitting on the surface or hovering slightly above it. It's very interesting because even if it's hovering above it, I would think both tidal forces and gravity would raise havoc on the earth or, or the ship. You're right. Either way, we're going to have some pretty big problems because that ship has some gravity of its own um, if it's that big. Mm -hmm. And the other problem is... So we'll get to we'll get to the other problem. But 
the first thing I wanted to say is just conservation of angular momentum. Let's say the ship was sitting on the earth. According to the equations for moment of inertia, um, the earth's rotation should slow down, ah. right? So think of if you were to, yeah, if you were like a figure skater or maybe even just sitting in a swivel chair and you had dumbbells in your hands and you started spinning around and then all of a sudden you dropped the weights, you'd start to spin faster. That's just conservation of the angular momentum. So what we're doing here is the opposite. We're adding mass. And so the spin is gonna to have to slow down. It's like when the skater starts to spread their arms out and expand their-, um, their Sort form. of, that's, that's a little bit different. With, then you're playing with the radius. So okay. in that case, you're playing with the, the radius variable. I'm talking about just mass. Got it. But both of them, yes, they do affect your rotational velocity. Okay. The other problem is, let's say this was hovering over the earth. And let's say this ship was able to um, just sit in space. The problem with being so enormous in space is gravity tries to crush you into a sphere. And that's why you see anything the size of Pluto and bigger is going to be a sphere. And that's something called hydrostatic equilibrium. Huh. So when you're that massive, gravity is essentially pulling you in um, from all directions. Interesting. And yeah, you would need an ultra strong sci science fiction strength material to be able to hold this elaborate shape, like, like a disc. Um, it would be a really hard time to fight against gravity just to be that shape, just to have that shape for your ship. And then the ship puts forces onto the ocean and gets complex tidal forces. Right, yeah. Just having two masses that close together, you're going to have ultimately some trade-off um, with tidal forces. I just want to find where he, oh, this is Burj Khalifa. Is this the tallest building? Yep, this is the tallest building in the world. It's in Dubai. I forgot how tall it is, 1,800 feet, 2,500 feet. Um, the Empire State Building is 1,472 feet. So. Yeah, Burj Khalifa is just under 2,000 feet tall. Mm -hmm. Because the- um, Yeah, look at that. The, um, <clears throat> if that's just under 2,000, then uh, the Freedom Center that Jimmy Chin climbed is like 1,500 feet tall. In New York? Yeah, it was about the height of uh, Snow King, only straight up, not mm -hmm. slanted. Yeah, Freedom Tower is uh, 1,700 feet. Okay, 1,700 feet. So they're pretty close. Yeah, only 200 feet shy. Well, what your point is, is that you, there's real building problems once you start getting over 2,000 feet. Yeah, and I think maybe even higher is when you have to worry about, like, the Earth's forces. So this little clip here, he describes what happens when you go above a certain height. You have to support their own weight, but only up to a point. If a structure was so tall that it wound up at the altitude of a geostationary orbit, it would start to feel a new force, not just a gravitational force downward, but all of a sudden this new centrifugal force up and outward. And so a building that tall could be stable through tension and more than 35,000 kilometers high. 
This kind of structure is known as a space elevator. Unfortunately, there aren't any materials known to science today that are strong enough to make building something that large feasible, with the exception maybe of carbon nanotubes or boron nitride nanotubes. Of course, if we went to a smaller celestial body like the moon, we could build one today out of stuff like Kevlar. There are a lot of different things that we have to um, so he mentions you can build a lot higher depending on the size of the planet you wish to build on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Earth is uh, kind of tricky. You could probably put up a cable sized tower, like in terms of thickness, up to, you know, thousands of kilometers into space but yeah this would be interesting if we if we could eventually construct a structure of this scale that would be able to just sit nicely onto the planet wouldn't it have to be on the axis um it would help it would help yes you're right it would help to put like to land this closer to the poles because you would experience less of that um, rotation because the equator spins at close to a thousand miles an hour. Whereas if you sit on the North Pole, you're basically stationary. You're only turning in place. Can we feel that as human beings? No. And the reason is, well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that it's extremely gradual. The earth is so large that um, wait, I think I heard something else. You can imagine it like this. We are, let's say you are spinning at the equator. People in Africa are just fine. They don't feel nauseous every day spinning that fast. But you can imagine you have to travel 25,000 miles in one day. And the acceleration you feel, let's say the centrifugal force, which is you kind of being lifted off the planet, right. is, is pretty negligible. It's similar to if you were in a car and you're traveling into a curve, the sharper the curve, you're gonna be like falling into the door. Unless you're super elevated. Yeah, if it's a really, really gradual curve, you can sit comfortably in the driver's seat and barely feel any sideways force. Got it. That's, I think, the most reasonable explanation I've heard about why we don't feel the earth turning. And we also um, don't really have a reference point we don't have things flying by at a thousand miles an hour. The things that we can see are just the distant stars, which barely move at all relative to us. So. Got it. Yeah. Uh, the next thing I wanted to explore. Well, can you, before you go on, uh, yeah. think about, he touched on that in that Vsauce, but what, did he say was the physical concept that would make a space elevator work at 30, you know, at uh, 100 miles up as opposed to, you know, a building more than a few thousand feet? So, yeah, you could kind of think, it at, think of it as instead of a solid building structure, more like a cable or a very slender tower. In that case, it's almost like, um, as he said, tension. You're like pulling on that wire. And wires are good at being pulled taut. Buildings, not so much. When you build that high, you start to feel more and more of that centrifugal force, that force being like launching you outward. Um, it's sort of just like the material. So Thinner. I guess the issue is what 
the top of the space elevator doesn't have to, it's not powered by anything more than its own angular momentum going around Earth, and it could still be right. uh, taught. Yeah. Um, and that's why you have this counterweight at the very top. But how much weight is a counter? Does that have to be a lot of weight or? I don't, I'm not sure. Let's, let's see. I'm sure there's a, there's a formula for that based on yeah. the length and the weight, the spin, you name it. Well, an, an asteroid. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> no, it's based on uh, how to keep it stable. Based on weight and uh, the distance and whatever other forces are keeping it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the reason it needs to be so thin is thinner structures such as cables respond better to tensile forces than traditional buildings that are made of, you know, many different materials. I think buildings respond better to compression. You think about building a house or building a three-story apartment building you can put as many bricks as you want on the roof and it all, the weight all goes through the, the beams and supports. Mm -hmm. They're, they respond really, really well to compression. Brick walls, for instance, can hold a ton of weight on the very top. Cables can respond to lots of force being pulled. So one is like a pulling response, the other is a pushing compression response. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I have to get the dog in. I'll be right back. Okay. Well, do you looks... think you're going to see a space elevator in your lifetime? That would be really, really cool. Uh, I don't see why not, to be honest. What would we do with it? Uh, <laughs> tourism. See these people? It's like almost oh, like a yeah. first wheel ride. Tourism. <laughs> Logical. Yeah. Well, it would be a lot cheaper to get things to the any ISS or space station, right? Yeah. And if you're going to take off with a ship going to Mars and you lock it in near Earth orbit or build it out there or put it together, you can do a lot of supplying it back and forth. Mm hmm. Now look at these people, just like. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yep. That would be something else. This has got to be at least ten thousand miles away. What does? This, the tip of this space elevator here. Look how tiny the Earth is. Oh yeah. That's a lot more than farther away than the uh, ISS, obviously. Yeah. ISS would be <laughs> beyond where you can see here. <clears throat> the ISS, how high is the ISS? The ISS is only about 100 miles, I think, 100 miles above away. the surface. And this is 200 something? This is 1,000 miles. This looks way more than 1,000 10, miles away. 10, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. I mean, just from the, uh, from the earth, size of the Earth. Space elevator, never heard of it. Well, you know, in the books, Adrian and I, as our daughter, we were reading, it came out around 2000. One was a series by Arthur C. Clarke and space elevators were in it big. And then, you know, there's a whole bunch of sci-fi that use space elevators mm -hmm. that have come out in the last 50 years, 20 years. Amazing, she hasn't taken physics, Stuart. Mm -hmm. After all, you explored with her. She just graduated from college. Mm -hmm. It's going to be also, uh, speaking of taking a ride on this, it's going to be ultra expensive $500 per kilogram. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? <laughs> Apparently. $500 per kilogram. Yeah. That's just the uh, 
that's thirty-five thousand dollars, isn't it? If you're a seventy-kilogram body. Yeah, that's about how much I am. Okay, so a seventy-kilogram <laughs> body at five twenty-five twenty-five thousand dollars, you say? Uh, that's chump change for some of the first class and private jets. That's true. Yeah, I know plenty of folks in Jackson Hole that could probably afford this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be crazy if we can get that in our lifetime. Well, I don't know. Who's thinking about it? Uh, <clears throat> um, and then I also was starting to think about AI mm -hmm. with that, that white sphere and mm -hmm. the difference between artificial intelligence and something called virtual intelligence. There's and also another term in there called generalized AI. Generalized AI. I don't think I've heard of that. I think that's what it maybe I maybe I have the wrong word for it. Um, might be strong AI. Artificial general intelligence? Yeah, artificial general. There it is, yeah. Maybe that's it. Or general. Yeah. I, I don't know. Well, go ahead with strong versus weak. Yeah. Um, what I've read is that strong AI, I don't think we're quite there yet, fully, uh, fully developed. We do have plenty of examples of weak AI. And the objective of weak AI is just to mimic the characteristics of human interactions. For example, Siri on the iPhone um, sounds and acts like another human being, but doesn't really have the ability to make its own decisions and to rationalize. Um, it's just a, it's an analog of a human. And you have plenty of examples of this online. Um, you have like Google Assistant Google does a lot for me. It organizes all of my tasks, my photos, my calendar. Um, it says like, good morning, Ryan, how are you? Like, what would you like to do today? And that is just mimicking another human. But strong AI may be closer to what, let's say Tesla is doing with autonomous driving. And, you know, there are a couple of caveats, which I'll get to in a second, but Tesla has the ability to um, make decisions and it's probably more alg algorithmic, algorithmic, I don't know if that's a word, but based yeah. on an algorithm, it says, okay, like there's a car in front of me doing 70 miles an hour. I need to stay this far back. There's a semi truck onto my right. I want to give way to it before anybody else. And it can kind of make good judgments based on the input it's given. Here's the caveat. What it cannot do is make moral or ethical decisions. Let's say it needs to stop short and it wants to do everything it can to avoid an accident. And the only two options are to hit a motorcycle or hit a minivan with children in it. And if like those are the two options, a computer can't obviously, at least not yet, make the decision, oh, what am I going to feel better with? Uh, that is something that I don't think we have the capabilities to replicate. Do we, is that, does that fall under the category and the human being of abstract thinking? Um. Abstract thinking, I don't know if you know what you know about it, but it's a, a property that we um, develop as human beings and develop more of as human beings, depending on our IQs and our experience around the mid to late teens. Abstract yeah. thinking doesn't start until after about age 12. Before that, they call it concrete thinking. That's right, Piaget's uh, learning theories. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. You don't Where have that sophisticated level. Is right. 
That's true. Yeah. Uh, so there is a whole other dimension of abstract thinking, um, imagination. And I think we touched on that a little bit when we were talking about how language developed with our early ancestors, which separated humans from other primates and other organisms is that we had the ability to think about the past and to think about the future. And you really think about it, past and future aren't real things. They are something that we conjure up. Or we remember or we imagine. Yeah, right. Um, memory isn't a concrete, physical, tangible thing. Neither is, the, neither is predictions about the future. They all just happen up here. We can't observe directly the past unless we have you know, a recording or artifacts. But, but that's all in our brain. It's all in our brain, yeah. Um, you know, teenagers, that's why I don't think we introduce algebra to little kids. We introduce it to um, people in middle and high school because they can see numbers in a different way. They don't need necessarily a correlation between a number and an object or something else. We can think about numbers abstractly as just ethereal elements. Hi, Deb. Hi, Deborah. Yeah. I was driving and I could get the Zoom on my cell phone, but I, I was muted and I couldn't unmute. No problem. So I, 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 I now I don't even know how to undo my, my, my phone. I'll just turn it off if I can. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Here we are. Oh. Traffic jam from the, uh, the from the village road. Yeah, summer's here. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um. Oh, so uh, so since I couldn't say it at the time, I'm probably the only one of you that has been on top of the Burj Khalifa. On oh, really? Top of the what? A building. The Burj Khalifa. Well, you can't get on top. You, um, it is, I don't know, 184 stories. And uh, the first, and it's a two elevator series. And you, the first time I was there, the, uh, the two elevators only went up to 124th floor. And the second time to the 148th floor, maybe. Where so, is this? Dubai. 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 Yeah, that was the right. building we were looking at earlier. Right. Wow, that's incredible. What yeah, is, it is. Do you know anything it's different gorgeous. up there, Deb? Well, you really are looking down at the tiny world. It's a... Uh, it, it's an experience. Is it like dizzying yeah. up there? Yeah, it is. And you can also, you can feel the building um, sway a little bit. Wow. And the floor on the observation deck, I mean, it's surrounded by plexiglass, so you can see. Um, but the floor is made of wood. And I was thinking, this is odd, but I think it's not only that it's light, but it's flexible. So it can withstand the torque that must happen with the wind. Uh, the wind and you know whatever whatever other physics are involved. Wow. Yeah. Bucket list, Stuart. That's on my bucket list for sure. <laughs> well, unless they have a, unless they have a to taller building by then. They you know they are proposing well, building the Kingdom Tower in Saudi Arabia, which is supposed well, to be. It's on. It's not proposed. It's on its way up. I've. It, it's um by Jeddah Airport. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I wonder if the uh, forces, if it's by the Jeddah Airport, if the forces of those large airplanes are going to influence the building in any way. That would be interesting. Uh, well, it would be, but um, they're up a fair amount, and it's quite substantial. 
Wow. Yeah. And it's I mean it's not on top of the airport. It's not part of the airport. It's just yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the way to the airport. <clears throat> yeah. Um but uh because Jeddah is the uh, is the oh is the main airport to get into Mecca and Medina. That's why Jeddah. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I wanted to just the last thing I want to touch on about AI is yeah. sort of how Tesla is sitting on the border between weak and strong AI. Um, and strong AI is like full on human capabilities, can make decisions, can rationalize. And that's sort of what has to be thought about if we want to make Tesla's completely autonomous and just have no necessary human input for trips on the road. Well, it's interesting because this issue has come up with, you know, in terms of uh, w war. Oh, interesting. And, you know, How having, so? a, huh? How so? Well, you know, in terms of having autonomous soldiers, you know, and I thought the issue even came up, there was some talk that Israel with his defenses was getting to the point that they, you know, they were at that line of being able to give what machines some level of strong AI in terms of making decisions on whether to fire, you know, hopefully in the defense and not offense, you know, at something coming in at it. But that's a fine line when the machine, if it's autonomous, could then be make an autonomous offense. To mm -hmm. Yeah. And the idea is that in the future, when you think about it, all wars are going to be fought by with autonomous. Yeah, I really, I really would be on board with that. I like that idea. Autonomous or, or remote, or drones or remote. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. The drone uh, issue has already been launched, so to speak. Sorry for the pun. Mm -hmm. uh, right, but right now the drones are, you know, done by decisions from somebody who's making the decision this far away. You know, if the when the drone gets to make its own decision, that's the next level. Did you see the um, play or read the play or hear any reviews of the play with uh, uh, the woman? I think it was uh, Roberts who was the actress, and she was in a uh, you know a military you know protected area, but she was controlling the drones. Hmm. When was this? This was, was she, was she controlling the drones or was she a psychiatrist to the guys who were controlling the drones she and had what? PTSD? Was she the psychiatrist to the guys controlling the drones because they had PTSD even remotely, which I've heard well, about. I thought she was the actual drone manager who was getting the PTSD. Is this Julia uh, Roberts you're talking about? I think it's so. a Julia Roberts. There are a couple of, of things she's done that are like that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I thought I, one of the plays was live, uh, you know, not quite Broadway, but maybe it was Broadway, but it was short lived, and one of them was a movie that was uh, not exactly nominated for Oscars, but in its plot and reviewed in the New Yorker, which I did not hmm. at the time. But it was a psychological impact of her as a human operating these drones, doing these semi-automatic things over the mid. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, like, you know, one side we have humans doing all of the decision-making operations, and the other one you're pretty much leaving it up to the boss themselves to 
mm -hmm. um, lead and execute. Mm -hmm. Not that far of a leap, is it? Pardon no, me, really, yeah. hungry dog. What'd you say, Deb? I said, pardon me, I have a hungry dog. <laughs> At least you have a dog that's alive. What do you mean? Oh, our dogs are alive too, but some friends of ours had to put down one of their two dogs suddenly in the last week or two. They killed their dog? Well, the dog had a big tumor that was uh, totally obstructing the GI system and it was complex. Yeah. Poor doggy. Yeah. Poor people, poor doggy. Yeah. As long as your dogs are okay. Yeah. In the middle of surgery, they had to make that decision. And so. So cool. We all are dog people, Ryan. Yes. <laughs> so. There's also, um, you know, the Turing test. Oh, the Turing test. Yes, I read about and that. And I think you need to have strong or generalized AI to be able to pass it. What is it? Yeah, it's pretty much a um, something that can tell the difference between a machine and a human. So here, Turing test. Uh, and they made a movie about this, The Imitation Game. So it, it's a test to see how well a machine can exhibit human-like behavior, in, making it pretty much indistinguishable from a human. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also, like, maybe you heard of Cleverbot? No. So Cleverbot's pretty interesting. I'll show you just a quick example. Um, okay. You can talk to this robot and this is like an example of AI. So I'm gonna ask, what is your name? And this is, I already told you my name. What was my first question? So, I mean, it's, it's a little bit weird. This isn't exactly how a human would talk to you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try it again. United States. South Carolina. If I ask like an emotional question, how do you like it there? Uh, let's see. Yes, very much. Um, not, not very uh, complex. What but if you say, are you depressed? No, you. <laughs> what does it say? It said no, you. <laughs> not you. <laughs> Well, how does this differ from the, um, the parodies of Siri doing a couples therapy? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh. Pretty much uh, same kind of complexity of AI here. I mean, um, it's concrete, but it's simple. It's, it's, um, it's not putting any of the blank screen into color mode. It's keeping the blank screen, the blank screen. Mm -hmm. Right. By being concrete. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Turing test is pretty much a test to see how well a machine imitates a human. Um, any other comments on AI? Was there another um, area you wanted to focus on? Yeah, the last thing was looking at the Earth's core because get to yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, aliens wanted to use uh, yes. that for fuel. Question came up, how long do we have before the Earth's core just cools off and we don't have any more heat? Um, so to start, there are 
three main processes going on that keep the earth warm. You have radioactive elements in the earth's crust and in the earth's core that are giving off energy. They're radiating heat. Um, that's one way we have heat um, coming from the earth's center. We also have convection. So it's that warmer magma moving up and then the cooler magna, magma sinking and you have this cycle. It's like a churning molten rock that's going on and that keeps heat flowing. Of course, then we have solar radiation, which is captured by Earth's atmosphere. And we have heat um, on the surface and we're able to retain that heat. It doesn't get freezing cold at night because we have an atmosphere to insulate all of that heat. Um, you'll notice like at high altitudes, for example, in Wyoming, it tends to cool down much more dramatically than it would here at sea level. Um, in New Jersey, when it's nighttime, we still have the same kind of 70 degrees, maybe even 80 degrees in the summer. But in Jackson, once the sun goes down, it can get into the forties. But that's just about the atmosphere. We're looking at- we have a lovely temperature range between the forties and the eighties. Yeah, yeah. And the eighties. And exactly. everybody else can eat their hearts out, but that's what we have. Mm -hmm. um, but then we ask, you know, how long do we have before something cools off? The earth doesn't have heat generation. It's really just heat recycling and just heat that's residual. The heat has always been here, you know, 4 billion years ago. Whereas, you know, things like the sun are constantly generating their own heat by fusing hydrogen atoms and releasing heat. Um, the larger the planet, the more heat it's going to retain. You can, this example I learned in college when we learned about just processes of heat, if you put a potato and a pea into a microwave and you heat them both up, maybe like five minutes, and then you take both of them out, which is going to cool off faster? The pea. The pea is going to cool off in seconds, where the potato is still hot to the touch several minutes after. And the reason is the surface area to volume ratio is larger with the pea than it is for the potato. So the pea can radiate less heat more quickly. It's very tiny and the surface area is pretty large in comparison. So the heat just sort of um, dissipates. Whereas the potato, huge volume, lots of heat, all those molecules are jumping around really fast. And there's only so much surface area for the heat to escape. A trick, if you wanna cool down the potato faster, is to cut it up. Cutting it up enlarges the surface area. You're giving the heat more chance to leave the potato. But you're also um, giving it more chance to go into the potato so it cooks faster. So yes, um, if you wanna cook the potato, then yes, you can warm it up faster if you cut it. Yeah. So it's all about heat transfer. It's not about necessarily temperature, hot and cold. It's just how fast heat moves in and out, the exchange. Um, so I looked at this article, how long do we have? How long before Earth's core runs out of fuel? How does this relate then to global warming? Um, it's not really the same thing. Global warming is the greenhouse effect that we have. Got it's it. trapping heat from the sun via molecules in the atmosphere. So we're talking about surface and air temperature steadily rising. Um, heat from the core really can't, you really can't do much to uh, alter that. Um, but we can alter what goes into the atmosphere and how it, um, 
changes how much heat we Experience. receive. Experience, yeah. yeah. Um, we're probably going to lose heat through radiation. Um, yeah, uh, radioactive decay more quickly than just cooling off, like leaking out through the surface. Um, this isn't the best article, actually. Yeah, so really what we have to take into account is this radioactive decay. And the half-life of some of the elements that are responsible for the heat dissipation have half-lives of hundreds of millions of years. Worse than Prozac, that has a half-life of one week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're going to get nailed by the sun. The sun is going to swallow us up way before we have to worry about the Earth losing all of its heat. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so it looks like even if we didn't have to worry about the sun, we have close to 100 billion more years before Earth gets as cold as Pluto. Mm -hmm. And what are we predicting for the sun eating us up? Five billion years. I'll just start to get ready now. <laughs> <laughs> and so Sorry. how do you balance the sun's impact on the earth and the earth's cooling etc and these rates which are quite different with the issue of global warming the thing is global warming is hard to predict um and also the solutions that we have, we don't, we don't know how effective they're gonna be, if at all. Um, we can only make predictions of what might happen if you know, the Earth's average temperature goes up by a fraction of a degree Celsius. Is it going to cause irreversible effects? Most people oh, no. don't have a clue. We can only really guess. Um, Irreversible is also a big word because the earth has gone through so many cycles of things. Exactly. The earth has so, experienced negative 40 degrees average temperature and also like positive 40 degrees average temperature. Maybe not that extreme, but it has gone through extreme yeah. warm periods as well. We've gone through mass extinctions. We've gone through asteroid impacts. We've gone through What's the average temperature volcanoes. now? What's the average temperature now? 15 Celsius. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's been that way. It's been plus or minus one degree Celsius for the last, I don't know, thousand years, 5,000 years, mm -hmm. I'd imagine. Let me see if there's a graph I can look at. Yeah, we only have really we only really have data from a few centuries ago. At all. Yeah, and you know, two thousand years is a tiny, tiny fraction of the Earth's entire history. So this doesn't really tell us much about the Earth's entire timeline. But you know, people can say this little black spike over here probably is a strong correlation to the industrial revolution. It's were they showing, systematic. were they showing on that video we watched a month ago mm -hmm. of the earth? You know, they were show. I was focused on percent oxygen changing. Were they showing surface temperature, temperature changing? Let's see.
We don't have temperature. Oh, average temperature in the upper left hand corner. See it? 28 yeah. degrees. Centigrade. 28 Celsius. That's like 80 Fahrenheit, 80 something Fahrenheit. This is 3 billion years ago. Stuart, has Adrian seen this? No. You got to show it to her. Where are we? Oh. We're over here, Deb. Well, I was just looking. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, so oh, I was just looking up about the Earth's core, and it's, um, it's nickel and iron for the most part. Is this a Scotese? No. This is oxygen just started appearing in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that's from some cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. It's getting is cold. The formation of Gondwana land. Oh, this is way before Gondwana land. This is pre Rodinia. There were there were other. Gondwana land is a little late in the game, actually. That's only five hundred million years ago, or something, right? And this is 2.5 million, 2.7. Billion. Yeah, 2.5 billion. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to leave in a couple of minutes. I want to ask you one question. Go ahead, yeah. So. The idea was that it seemed a little out of place was a little that they were concerned that as soon as they broke into the core in the movie, mm -hmm. that that second all of Earth would be destroyed. I'm in that's yes. seems, you know, like it would be a process, a long process, you know. It's not I, thought, be it, yeah, I thought the same be, thing. The very second that you drill into the earth, I don't really think it's going to have crazy bad consequences. It would really have to be a long-term thing where you're disrupting some part of the geothermal processes going on. And the magnetic field, theoretically, and then the- Yeah, atom. you would have to really do a lot of damage on high magnitudes to worry about the whole planet. Yeah, I don't think there would be any immediate consequences. Mm -hmm. That's what my thought was. So this is minus uh, eight, almost minus 20 degrees. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it got warm all of a sudden. What's almost minus 20 degrees? The Earth at this at the moment depicted. See, so in the upper left hand corner. Celsius. Mm -hmm. Circum superior uh, trans Hudson orogeny. Beginning of the boring billion. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
So YouTube who? Oh, it doesn't say history of the earth. So it looks like it stays pretty stable, 12, 13 degrees Celsius. And then all of a sudden we have uh, ice ball again, where it went down to like minus 30. Got it. And then quickly back to uh, temperate normal. A few hiccup ice ages here and there, 30 Celsius. No, now things are getting recognizable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. oh, I'll, I'll go. Yeah. There are a couple of different. I really uh, like his channel. Yeah. Cartoon, uh, cartoons of the Earth. Mm -hmm. um, What's it called? This is by A L G O L. Huh. And uh, there's another, the other one is Scotese, Christopher Scotese does one on, on YouTube. And there's some others. I can't remember the name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Stuart's gone. Bye. Yeah, he just left. He's a patient right now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they killed the queen, but apparently there are, there are sequels possible with other uh, queens and ships is what I gathered from oh, this. His battery ran out. He wants to say goodbye. Goodbye. Mm. What did you say, Deb? Please repeat that. I think that there, there's potential for sequels because they only killed the one queen, but they yeah. alluded to other um, queens and, and, and whatever you want to call these beings. I was definitely left with that impression that they have another one coming out. Yeah. And then there, the ships were powered by cold fusion. Yes. Right. A tribute to Utah. Yeah. Uh, and the whole thing about Area 51, which has a, 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 a dry salt lake, like the, the Bonneville Flats. One, uh, um, salt Flats of Utah? No, it's in Nevada, uh, I think. In Nevada? Yeah. Is that where Roswell was? I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. But. Hmm. So Ryan, what else? Um, that was all I had for my presentation. It was just the description of that giant ship that was hovering over the earth and then relationship between virtual intelligence, strong, weak AI, and then yeah. finally a, a small talk about uh, the earth's core cooling off eventually. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, I was in the midst of uh, driving, as I said, but Oan, I think mentioned, and you we talked for a moment about how would it affect the oceans, the tides, to have a ship that big? Um, I don't know. Uh, I think the gravity not... of the ship would pull all the water toward it. Yeah. And then it would only be like a one thing tide because the ship is staying where it is. The water would sort of migrate, maybe flood some places, and then that's it. Uh, it, yeah. an, it would be a significant flood. It would be like yeah. a, a right. water drain, drench. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Which would probably either confuse people or put people in a position where they needed to be educated about it. Mm. If you know what I mean. 
Yeah. Oh. Who would have thought oh. 3,000 miles across would be Siberia? That's where they'd have to. It'd be very cover. interesting to see if there would be um, uh, temperature differences too. Does temperature ever affect the gravitational tidal forces or not? I don't think so. I don't think they really are related. Got it. Just curious. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Cool. I'm going to have to go to deal with the doggies. All right. Thank okay. you. For Wednesday night physics lesson. Yes. Yeah. Seriously. All right. I think I'm not. You take care. I, I, ha I need to look into how much our core is actually heated by a radioactive process. Yeah, it's surprisingly more than I thought when I first learned about it. Because what I just saw on Wikipedia, you know, as I say, it was it's predominantly nickel and iron. So how radioactive can that be? Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I barely looked at it because we were in the midst of things. But the radioactivity yeah. doesn't really go to the outer, to the mantle um, as a process. It might, you know, maybe as, as heat, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But it doesn't come out as lava. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. All right. Next week? Yep. Next Wednesday. Take care. Take care, you all. All right. Kiss, kiss the doggies, Owen. Thank you. I will. And kiss uh, your Sufi. Sophie. Sufi. Sufi. No, Sufi. 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 Sufi the mystic and the poet. <laughs> Take care. To Lou. Bye. Unless Ryan can tell me how to unmute my Zoom phone. Oh, yeah. I've had that problem before. Uh, did you solve it? Yeah, I think I just like went onto my phone and just hit end meeting. And then it only ends the meeting for that device. So it doesn't okay. do anything on the computer. Right, but, but so, I, well, I just closed the phone down because I couldn't do that. But when you're actually on the phone, because there was on the phone with, with you guys for half an hour. Yeah. Um, and I could not unmute it. I could hear you, but you couldn't hear me. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, there's just like a little button with the microphone on it, on the phone. I looked at that and all it did was mute you. Oh, uh, so I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, oh well, okay. So next time, something good. Yep, sure thing. Okay, <laughs> bye. All right, bye.